Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Climate, the most important issue of our time, featuring Nick Humphrey. Nick Humphrey is a meteorologist who lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. He has a bachelor's degree of science in interdisciplinary studies from South Dakota State University and a master's degree in geosciences, applied meteorology, from Mississippi State University. Nick and I spoke on September 2nd about the unfolding climate crisis, including carbon levels, ocean acidification, rising temperatures, extreme weather, feedback loops, methane emissions, effects on agriculture, technological challenges of reversing effects, and the hope that the youth might lead the way to change. Twenty twenty has obviously been a big news year for a lot of reasons, you know, with yeah. the uh, with the pandemic and then with the Black Lives Matter uprising that's been happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, obviously, those things have all needed our attention and and taken our attention. And, and then at the same time, I think largely due to the nature of media in this country, the, the media isn't able to focus on too many issues at once, and so it feels like climate has been getting sidelined. Yeah, yeah, it, it it does. I mean, it's been it's been a absolutely crazy year. I mean, the pandemic is 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 ridiculous, and then yeah, like you said, the Black Lives Matter protests have been incredible and and taking a lot of time. And what's been happening civil with civilly. So yeah, climate doesn't doesn't stop changing just because of, the, of human other human issues and and stories. It's a part of the. It's a part of the human life and, and eco ecosystem life, so yeah, it continues. Right, and so like the spring, I believe, wasn't there a new record um, measurement at the Hawaii station for uh, carbon in the atmosphere? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if it was four fourteen or four sixteen parts per million. It was really high. Um, it, yeah, it continues to. Tin, continues to climb relentlessly um, every single year, and, and usually peaks in, in May or June. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it continues to rise, and I mean the effects of of, of the uh, of all the carbon we're putting in the atmosphere now will still be impacting the climate ten, twenty, thirty years from now. So, uh, and the reason that the number usually hits the peak in may in the northern hemisphere has to do with uh plant life doesn't it yeah 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 the yeah the uh, um yeah the uh this the nature of the seasonality of of winter going into spring the plants are they're growing and so there's less carbon um uh uptake and more of it and sitting in the atmosphere and then it declines going into into late spring and summer as you get more plants uh, respirating carbon um but but obviously, they can't. There's not enough plants to to decline the amount of carbon because we're pumping so much more in the atmosphere than can be um, respirated. So it continues to climb every single year. Right. And just as as a quick kind of review of the of the basics of the situation, uh, how is it that carbon is relating relating? How is it that um, carbon is leading to more heating in the atmosphere? So carbon dioxide is a is a greenhouse gas, and that means that it um, um, tends to absorb and re-emit heat. Um, and uh, when you get uh, more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's like adding layers, layers of bl- of a blanket um, to a planet. And the more layers you add, the less heat can escape off into space. And so it the atmosphere's is transparent to visible wave wavelengths of radiation, so that so the sunlight comes in, hits the surface of the Earth, 
warms the surface, warms the oceans, warms the land, that heat is released. Some of it escapes, but a lot of it gets trapped. And uh, and, uh, as you add more carbon dioxide, more methane gas, nitrous oxide, other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, that um, leads to greater uh, warming of, of, uh, of the planet. So you add more greenhouse gases, the planet can heat up um, more and do so faster if you add it faster, which is what we're doing. Right. So the heat is uh, from the sunlight is getting trapped. More of it uh, in the past would have been escaping into the atmosphere than is now. Yeah, right. 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 And then so it's also, I think, a, a part of this that, that people uh, maybe haven't been quite as aware of is the fact that a lot of the excess heat that hasn't been bouncing back out uh, that's been trapped here has been absorbed by the oceans over the last few decades. Yeah. Yeah. About um, 90 percent of the heat actually goes to the ocean. The ocean covers approximately 70 percent of the Earth's surface. So it it. um um, if it wasn't for the oceans, the I mean, the, the global average temperature would be, you know, 20, 30 C warmer. <laughs> wow. I mean, it would be it would be crazy. Um, I don't remember the exact value. Someone did did the calculation one time in an in a article. But, um, yeah, it would be it would be extreme. So the oceans, because um, water has a higher heat capacity, meaning it takes more heat to warm it by one degree Celsius or Fahrenheit than it does to warm uh, land, land mass. Um, so because of that, it can take a lot of heat. It takes time to warm ocean, but it also takes time to cool the ocean. So there's a, um, we call it a latency where um, you add, adding heat to the oceans, it takes time for them to warm up. But even if you stop global warming, the oceans will continue to warm for a long time before you would be able to um, stop ocean warming. So um, that's that's kind of a big deal because much of the life on the planet is in the oceans and they're very sensitive to changes in temperature. So you have warming oceans yeah, that can affect the, you know, the ability of, of ocean life to survive and thrive in the oceans. Right, because the ma- the most amount of our oxygen comes from life in the ocean, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much of the yeah the uh, the plankton and uh, phytoplankton and other species of plant life they release um, uh, uh, most of the oxygen in, in, into the atmosphere. So it's a very important uh, source of oxygen for the planet. Plankton, uh, they breathe in carbon dioxide and exhale, or however you would put it, um, oxygen? Yeah, yeah, phytoplankton, the plant uh, plankton. Oh, so plankton's a plant. I guess I hadn't realized that. That's kind yeah, of there's two. Yeah, there's two types. There's phytoplankton, which do photosynthesis, and then zooplankton, which are animal animals that breathe in oxygen. So um, there's two types of plankton. Oh, okay. I, had, I hadn't caught that somehow. Mm-hmm. And then is the the warming is this is that related to the acidification of the ocean? Um, uh, to some degree, yeah. The um, the carbon um, carbon dioxide or used to um, that's um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's absorbed by the ocean or dissolved in the ocean. It's, it used to be called carbonic acid. It's a it's a sort of um, acidic it acidifies the ocean so the um as the the oceans warm because of the increased heat retainment by more carbon being put in the atmosphere but the oceans do absorb some of that carbon from the atmosphere through um through uh, direct uh, absorption from the air or from precipitation that falls in the ocean and it also that leads to acidification of the ocean so it's kind of a for ocean life, it's a bit of a double whammy. You're getting um, warming that impacts um, impacts um, ecosystems, but you're also getting acidification. and And these parameters are very finely tuned in animal and plant life um, because if you um, obviously warm the ocean, the the life life forms in the ocean, you know, they breathe, they thrive in certain certain ranges of temperatures and then also the acidification can affect shells um, because they're made of um, um, certain certain minerals and those minerals will dissolve 
um, faster in a more acidic ocean. So it's a it's a big double whammy for life to deal with both a warming ocean and an acidifying ocean as well. Right. And there's been cycles, I guess, over time with the earth being warmer and with the ocean being more acidic, but it hasn't been, it's been a long time since uh, it's been where we've gotten it to. Yeah. Yeah. And um, obviously the, the pace of change is, is incredibly dramatic. Like usually you may see changes in the, in the acidity of the ocean and the temperatures of the ocean over uh, thousands to tens of thousands of years. I think it, it, I think the, it took like 11,000 years to transition from the ice age where we were four degrees colder than pre-industrial to um, uh, temperatures of the, of the most recent um, uh, climate period that we're in or seem to be leaving now, I suppose, but the, the Holocene. Um, but now we're conducting these changes um, in a matter of, you know, a couple hundred years. And now it's really this, this century is going to be on a pace of just decades where you could see warming of, of uh, an additional one, two, three degrees Celsius um, above, uh, above um, um, pre-industrial levels. So, I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's change that's, that um, is unprecedented in, and certainly in human history and maybe in the history of, of the world in, you know, in the past, um, 20, 30, 40, 50, I mean, many millions of years. I mean, I, I would, you know, I would go back to the extinction of the dinosaurs as being only an event that was faster in terms of change in climate, global climate than what we're doing now. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's so fast. You, you, nobody really knows what effect that will have on life forms ability to adapt to those changes uh, over time. I mean, I, I mean, life on this planet is pretty resilient and has, has gone through a lot over, over obviously these millions to billions of years, uh, but can they withstand these changes in climate that are on, this, on the order of just decades? Uh, I don't think really anyone knows the answer to that. Right, because that's the we don't. I mean, we haven't we haven't observed anything like this before. Obviously, yeah, and we can just see these numbers changing, but we don't know. Yeah, I, I yeah, yeah, I, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, is there? There's also a point like there's a maximum amount of heat, at least theoretically, right, that the ocean can absorb, and then it won't be able to absorb anymore. Am I correct on that being part of the science too? Um, well, it can, it, it can, uh, I mean, it can absorb as, it can absorb as a, a certain, um, it absorbs heat, but also releases it. I don't, I don't know if there's a, a limit to it. I mean, as long as the ocean stay li in liquid form <laughs> and right. don't boil away, uh, <laughs> right. that would be, yeah, that would be bad. But, um, uh, but obviously even as it, even as there's an absorption of heat, there's, Decades within, you know, decades later, there's um, a release of heat as you get um, back to the atmosphere in the form of these higher temperature anomalies as you get um, normal climate process happening like El Nino's. El Nino's have gotten um, the temperature anomalies have grown associated with El Nino's um, where the, um, in the tropical Pacific, for example, you get abnormally warm water temperatures in La Nina's. Where you get abnormally cooler water temperatures have, have, have seemingly diminished over the past 20 years or so, where they're just not as um, intense or consequential because the temp water temperatures are warming in general. So cooler than normal isn't as isn't as cool as it used to be. Um, so you're getting um, everything keeps um, going upwards in terms of in terms of, of, of heating. So you get um, re greater releases of heat to the atmosphere, even as it is absorbing um, um, this heat, it comes out, um, you know, decades later and gets um, and, and warms the atmosphere in response. Um, so um, it's, it's a, 
it's a slower process with the oceans because of the heat capacity of the oceans, but um, there's always a, a point of catch up um, where you get the effects of global of global warming and and the effects of the all the carbon that was poured into the atmosphere 20, 30 years ago uh, down the line because of the of the oceans. And that also relates to you know say you know melting of of sea ice and glacier ice as well. Yeah, so when we're talking about sea ice, uh, that's one other story that I've uh, been following um, sort of in the margins is the sea ice um, levels in the Arctic this year, which have been low again. Yeah. Yeah, they they have. It's looking like um, um, we may avoid a, a record low sea ice extent minimum in the next um, couple of weeks, it, it, but it could be the second lowest on record. Um, it's it's part of that long term trend. Some years are better than others, but the trend is always downward in terms of the amount of ice left in the Arctic. And um, I think a lot of um, scientists that study that area specifically are pointing towards the you know twenty thirty twenty. The, you know, 35 mark is sort of the beginning where you start to see a uh, true uh, blue ocean in the central Arctic basin. I mean, you're already seeing blue ocean every almost every year now in in the Siberian seas. Uh, uh, you know, the Laptev Sea, the Kara Sea, the East Siberian Sea, where there's very little ice remaining. Uh, by September in those regions and the water temperatures get very abnormally warm because there's just no reflect white reflective ice, this high albedo ice, which means most of the visible light gets reflected and therefore you don't get very much warming that's retreated seasonally more and more every, every year or a couple of years. And you have greater warming of the ocean and, and that warming can um, alter jet stream patterns in the northern hemisphere, um, I'm already hearing uh, some uh, some meteorologists are seeing in say computer models that there's going to be some altered impacts from the jet stream in the con- this month because of of the very low sea ice extent uh, this year. Um, so those though though that sea ice change and it has impacts that that impact the weather, the short term weather, but also Seasonally, as you're losing more and more ice, it has impacts on the climate for the northern hemisphere as well. Right, because the Arctic has, um, and this is what I'm hoping you can perhaps to, to help explain a little bit, the Arctic is at once um, feeling the effects of climate change more drastically there than at lower latitudes and at the same time what happens in the arctic you know changes other other places too yeah yeah the the one of the reasons uh for the uh for the rapid rise in temperatures in the arctic compared to other places is the loss of is the loss of sea ice it's, it's so responsive to rising air temperatures that you it gets thinner, retreats, and as a result, more dark ocean relative to that white ice gets exposed. It warms. It really it, the top ocean releases heat to back to the atmosphere, warms the atmosphere uh, temperatures, and also not only over the ocean but the surrounding land masses, and that in response melts more ice, melts in some places, melts the snowpack and the glaciers of the Arctic faster. And so over the course of decades, you get this accelerating warming of the Arctic and it ends up being faster than say the mid latitudes where you don't have these, um, have such rapid um, responsive changes in the, in the local climate in the in regional climate. So the, the, the Arctic uh, is is a really dramatic example of what you could co- of what you could call abrupt climate change. It's it's truly abrupt what's happening up there. Permafrost is melting dramatically, and when you have um, 
the the um, Arctic warming so much uh, faster than the middle latitudes that re- reduces the temperature difference between the Arctic and the middle latitudes, which can make at least the theory goes there's still a lot of debate amongst climate scientists about how much the middle latitudes are being impacted by the uh, by the cli- changing climate in the Arctic. So I, I put that out there just to make sure people understand it's still a, a controversial discussion going on in the scientific community. Mm-hmm. But the theory goes that it makes the jet stream wavier, which can cause more extreme weather events in the middle latitudes. So you can get uh, more intense uh, downward waves, downward, in this case being towards the equator, we call them troughs of low, lower pressure, and that can produce bigger storms and and um, and and other um, activity in the mid latitudes, um, even cold snaps in the winters, um, and then in the in and particularly in the summertime, you can get amplifying waves that amplify poleward these high pressure systems that become so big they sit in the same place for a long time, stall out or block the the airflow, the west to east airflow, and you get um, intense heat waves in the same place for weeks at a time. So um, that's still being hashed out in terms of the science, but I think there's some reason to suggest that the Arctic has has can have dramatic impacts on what's going on in the mid latitudes in terms of the ext- extreme nature of the weather. Yeah, because there's been a number of very memorable occasions of this over the last few years of the wavy jet stream where there's been cold snaps happening in one part of the northern hemisphere and then right next to it uh higher than usual temperatures. I remember a Christmas a couple of years ago where there was a recorded temperature in Greenland that was higher than the recorded high in LA that same day. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was during yeah. one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I happened to be in the LA area at that time. And so it was, it was, it was, it was kind of funny. That's not what you'd expect for LA, but so, so when, so, so you, we were sort of, it seems like we were sort of uh, starting to get into the topic of uh, feedback loops there. Um, when we're talking about what's happening at the Arctic, where the ice melts, there's more clear, there's more ice free water that absorbs more heat that makes it hotter, you know, which can cause the ice to melt more. And there's others, uh, like this too, and other dangers from this too. So, uh, the methane, I think is something that we should, we should definitely talk about because we're seeing, I, I've been seeing some stories about that this year too, about, um, uh, methane emissions and like um, uh, there was just photographs recently of one of those places where there was a methane bubble that came up and now there's a big hole in the ground, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, pingos, I think they call them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Out of the uh, Arctic um, permafrost. Yeah. The, 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 if there's, <laughs> if there's been something, one thing that's been really controversial in, in the climate science community is trying to deal with how the effect of, of the natural methane will have on the climate system. Uh, because I've, uh, obviously, um, there's, uh, you know, Dr. Shakova and others have done direct research in, in the East Siberian Arctic shelf to try to quantify the amount of methane and how rapidly it could be released to the atmosphere, um, based on the, f- the potential failure of, of permafrost, subsea permafrost that's submerged in waters that are warming because of ocean warming in the Arctic Ocean. Um, while other scientists are like, no, 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 that's it's too slow of a process. It's not going to happen on the scale. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the permafrost on the land that's melting very rapidly. That's indisputable. And you have thawing um, organic material that depending on how on on the processes that are going on in terms of uh, rotting of that organic material, it can either release carbon dioxide or release lots of methane to the atmosphere as well. Um, I think it's something that's uh, definitely concerning uh, because um, the methane is a is a more uh, powerful greenhouse gas, especially on shorter time scales than 
uh, carbon dioxide is. Carbon dioxide is the king over a long time scale. So over de- over many decades, hundreds of years, carbon dioxide is going to be sitting around. And methane, in fact, um, gets um, um, converted to carbon dioxide in water, I believe, in the chem- in, in, a, in a reaction with um, you know um, ultraviolet light. It gets uh, converted into carbon dioxide over time as well. But in the in the shorter time scales. When you have more methane, the initial release of methane that uh, methane uh, has uh, more potency uh, molecule versus molecule to carbon dioxide, and um, so I think it's it's really crucial to to understand um, how much methane is really coming out of the coming out of the soil and out of the ocean, Arctic Ocean to determine for, you know, our future, just how dramatic climate change and, and, and global warming will be. Uh, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of focus, a lot of focus on human emissions, which obviously are, 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 are driving all of this and all of this climate change and, and global warming. I think, I think over half of the, uh, human emissions um, that humanity has ever put into the atmosphere in the industrial uh, industrial area have been since 1990. <laughs> wow! I mean, just mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, and the first IPCC report came out in 1990. Um, so I mean, it's it's de- it's definitely the main driver. But I think um, understanding these feedback loops and understanding the methane that's really important. And, and I think I think most of the, the science the science is really just playing catch up with understanding these the effect of these feedback loops uh, and uh, in the role natural methane is playing in, in driving the warming to accelerate faster uh, because I mean it, it, but we have to we have to figure it out because it, it's it's going to impact everything then the temperature levels and the rate of change could be you know difference between um, life on this planet, being able to handle it, barrel, you know, um, perhaps barely, but be able to handle it versus not be able to handle it at all and having a you know, mass extinction of life on the planet. And the possibility of mass extinction, this, this could have a number of different sources. I mean, I, I guess runaway, runaway warming is one idea, right? That, that, that is what could, um, lead to extinction events. Yeah, yeah, you've had um, in the past, such as during the Permian mass extinction, um, um, extreme runaway global warming. But even, I mean, that global warming occurred over thousands of years. <laughs> I uh-huh. mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's a, it's, a, I think you had four, to, I mean, I think it may have been at least four to six degrees Celsius of warming. Um, but I mean, it was um, devastating. And ocean acidification, very rapid ocean acidification, it was just devastating to life on the planet um, because of all the carbon released from the Siberian traps. Uh, but uh, I, you know, here we're doing um, much more dramatic change in a very, very short, much shorter amount of time. And I'm not, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, I try to keep some level of of optimism for the future, but it, it seems like we're, I'm not sure we're coming to terms with just how rapid, um, um, the changes we are doing to the environment are going to impact, uh, life on the planet. You know, there's only so much change that life can handle, but we, yet we don't really know the limits. We just have examples of the past and the past does not, doesn't make things look very good. <laughs> In ter- you know, in terms of those changes uh, being able to be handled by life forms in, that that have very specific conditions. I mean, I mean, I, I I believe I read one of the IPCC special reports a couple years ago. Or, um, I think I don't know if it was the land one on the land or the cryosphere, but they mentioned that there seemed to be signs of accelerated evolution where some life were trying to adapt faster to the changes that were occurring in their environment. And of course, other life were, were simply migrating um, out of the tropics because it's getting hotter or 
out of certain fisheries because the oceans or the local ocean was warming. Um, you know, life is, is doing everything possible to try to adapt to these changes, but how fast can it, can it do it is, is the big question. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely the big question. And I, you know, I know people who work with wild plant populations, um, who have been involved with, uh, efforts to, uh, in a, of assist with, um, assisted migration, you know, with some plant species because plants, you know, uh, obviously have a harder time moving than, you know, yeah. birds or mammals or anything, you know, like that. Yeah. 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 They've, uh, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I've, I've, uh, I've heard of, uh, some, um, of some of those, um, uh, attempts at like assisted migration. Um, uh, yeah, plants, uh, plants are really in big trouble and because of their, you know, they, they depend on animals moving their seeds, you know, to different places in order to, in order to grow in, in new environments. And otherwise they're stuck where they are. And, and it's, it, it doesn't bode well for, uh, agriculture simply because, the places that humans have have put their crops are based on the local environmental conditions and not only the conditions of the the temperature and the rainfall but also the soil the fertility of the soil and so if you're losing um land because the the temperatures are becoming too inhospitable and you're losing rainfall either because you're well, I mean, in some cases, you might be getting too much rain or obviously not enough. You're getting too much drought. You're going to lose that otherwise fertile land because you can't grow food there because it's too hot, say, too hot or too dry or too wet or too even cold. You might you might get a, a situation where it's actually getting too cold or too wet uh, to support your your crops. And you have to try to move somewhere else to to restart your your plant your your agriculture uh but you have to worry if the soil is fertile enough for the for the plant growth so there's a lot of complications for humanity uh, when it comes to trying to uh keep their their uh, their agricultural uh, the ways the way they've done agriculture uh functional um and that i don't even include things like sea level rise where you might have coastal plains that are relatively flat and fertile for agriculture being flooded permanently by the ocean and you get saltwater intrusion of the soil and you can't grow plants or your uh, agricultural plants in those areas anymore either. So um, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that humanity will be facing and, um, and already starting to face right now, but we'll face more of very soon. in a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... <laughs> And you've uh, you're there in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, and so you've um, seen or, or been hearing about the challenges that farmers have been ha having because they've been having a lot of them the last few years. There was those huge floods, right? The year like last year. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was last year. Yeah, we had those uh, those devastating floods, and um, I mean, it was it was right up right up close and personal, not, not Lincoln avoided actual flood flooding, but we had, um, um, had, um, some wells that supply water to the city, um, lose power. And we had to conserve water in the city because they were flooded out, um, and damaged, um, in a, in the County over. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the, the effect of those floods was devastating, obviously to agriculture, lost a lot of, um, cropland to the water, 
Um, some of the supply, some of the previous like store grains got got damaged, um, and obviously some livestock were lost as well. And then and then this year, you know, what was the last month we had the derecho that went through Iowa and devastated um, so, uh, a lot of cropland in Iowa as well. Um, Let, and, let's uh, talk about the derecho for a minute because that was I, I grew up in the in the Midwest and I never remember hearing anything like that before. Yeah, the um, uh, derecho, you know, maybe a, uh, it's a maybe a, a relatively newer uh, term, at least in the public eye. Um, uh, it's they they occur occasionally on the plains every year. You get these events where you get high high winds, a lot of rain. Um, these they we, they call them mesoscale convective systems. Meso meaning mid size convective meaning thunderstorm and it's a complex of storms so it's a system and they provide a lot of rainfall during the summer to places like iowa kansas nebraska oklahoma um, uh, that would uh, otherwise dry out during the summer months uh, but occasionally you can get these very intense ones that are long-lived produce a lot of wind and and um, if they um, last long enough, they get they get um, called a, a derecho, which is um, this means straight line wind, just straight blowing wind um, that can blow for you know ten fifteen minutes and successive bursts and and bring down lots of trees and bring down crops, damaged crops. Um, this one was particularly uh, intense, I and mean, it had gusts estimated to 130, 140 miles per hour. I mean, it was very, very, very uh, in, uh, devastating storm. Um, some people refer to it as an inland hurricane. It had certainly had the hurricane force winds um, associated with it. Caused a lot of damage in um, in, in in eastern, uh, in central, and eastern Iowa. Um, I I had I have known um, some research that suggests that these type of storms, these mesoscale convective systems have been on the increase in, on the plains in Midwest in recent decades. I think a couple of years ago, actually maybe in 2017 or 2018, there was a U.S. climate assessment that came out and they suggested that these type of storms have been increasing on the plains and there may be some connection to global warming because of, because of that. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure the the physical mechanisms that may be driving uh, these storms becoming more frequent. I, I mean, the, they typically form along uh, along um, sort of stationary frontal boundaries, and you get all this warm, moist air that comes up from the Gulf of Mexico, and sh uh, still a fast moving jet stream for the summer months, and then these storms develop, they congeal, and then you get an organized system that blows through generally from west to east um, across multiple states and can cause a lot of damage. Um, so um, it seems that over time, over the past several decades, they've been getting more of these convective systems and during the summers in the Midwest and the Great Plains. And, and obviously, um, with growing crops, that can mean the potential for a loss um, as they blow through and cause um, these intense uh, wind speeds uh, and heavy rain as well. So you can get flooding, you can get damaging winds, um, and they can level your crops. So it, it, they have more of them happening, uh, perhaps because of climate change is, not a, is obviously not a good thing. And part of the reason why we have more of these extreme events with climate change is because as there's more heat in the atmosphere, there's also more moisture in the atmosphere? Yeah, yeah. Um, warmer warmer air can hold more hold more moisture. So you get, um, and this is an issue with, particularly with tropical in the tropics with um, things like hurricanes, you get more moisture and you can get higher rainfall rates because of it. So you, the number of uh, um, of events that are like three inch, four inch, uh, inches an hour rainfall, they've been increasing as the atmosphere has been warming because the atmosphere can hold more water. 
and it precip- precipitates out faster as a result. Um, and and there's also in the tropics been an issue where the the, um, the general circulation that drives the steering of tropical cyclones and tropical activities slowing down. So not only do you get higher rates of rainfall per hour because of a warming atmosphere, but these systems sit in the same place for for hours or days longer than they than they used to, or they tra- transverse more slowly through an area. So the total rainfall is higher. And this was a, a famous example of this, obviously, was um, was a couple um, infamous examples. One would be Hurricane Harvey, where it just stalled out and sat in the same place for days, dumping historic amounts of rain in the Houston metro area, 40, uh, 40 50 inches of rain. Uh, I think the total rainfall in one location exceeded 60 inches. And That's this was insane. a matter of, yeah, and it's a matter of like four days that this occurred. And uh, another famous one is actually from a year ago this week, Hurricane Dorian, which um, traversed over the northern Bahamas, moving around one or two miles an hour with winds of 160, 170 miles an hour in devastated portions of the northern Bahamas. It just sat in the same place for day for a couple of days, two or three days, um, absolutely trashing um, the, uh, uh, you know, the parts of the Bahamas. So. Um, and there's been studies showing that tropical cyclone forward speed is slowing down because of um, climate change. And it's been happening over the course of several decades, this progressive slowdown of systems. So the systems are becoming wetter themselves, but they're also moving more slowly, dumping more total amounts of rain over this, over, over a particular area, uh, so it's uh it's a bad combination cuz it I mean it just absolutely um uh, devastates the area that it's sitting under. Right, and it it's really felt as though the last 20 years and especially the last 10 there's been an increasing number of records getting broken, you know, and for, you know, temperature, for extreme weather, and I, for um, hottest years on record, what the 10 hottest years on record have all been in the last 15 years, I believe, at this point, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, I believe so, yeah. Right. I mean, I mean we had um, hottest year on record in uh, hottest year on record in 14, 15, 16, and we have yet to break the 2016 record, but I mean, it's been like the second, third hottest on record. We've had like if you look at the top five, every year has been a top five year for heat globally in the past several years. Right. And because of the lag time that you talked about earlier between the carbon emissions coming into the atmosphere and then the heat that they cause, the changes that we're feeling now are from carbon that we emitted in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. The 80s and the, and the 90s. Yeah. I mean, it's... uh it's uh i mean this is the the impact of that acceleration in 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 um in in climate or in um carbon emissions um we obviously the the u s was a big and continues to be a big big emitter of carbon it was in the seventies and eighties china uh caught up in the in the nineteen eighties and nineties because of their industrialization policies um so, I mean, a lot of people like to, to blame China for everything, but I mean, the carbon that's in the how much of it is, is from, uh, emissions from, um, from the United States and even going back to Great Britain when they, um, or early on were, were the big emitter of carbon in the early and early period of industrialization. So, uh, China's just sort of play, play catch up and is now, now doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know what's happening now is because of um uh, because of the behavior of humanity particularly the the richest countries the richest people in the 1980s 1990s and what's happening now will impact the world in in, t- in the 20 
thirties, forties and fifties. So, yeah. Right. Like, so even if we stopped all of our carbon emissions now, we would still, it would still be mid century. Uh, it would be, it would, the, there would continue to be a heating up until mid century at least. Yeah. 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 And I mean, it, um, and I mean the, the, the model projections, the climate models, which, um, they, you know, they don't account for everything. They don't account for the, for the methane emissions, which is still being debated how much that's impacting and will impact the climate. They don't account for, um, explicitly necessarily the fee, all the feedback loops that are still being actively studied. Um, uh, but I mean, will definitely be, you know, globally, global average temperature. So that includes the land in the ocean, which of course lags, slow, you know, slows things down to a degree because of all the heat that gets absorbed by the ocean before it warms. Um, he's talking about at least two to two, two and a half degrees of, of warming relative to pre-industrial by, by, you know, the 2040s. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's that's a dramatically different world than what we have now. It doesn't seem like a, a lot, but it's it is. I mean, it's very um, altered. I mean, in that kind of environment, a lot of coral coral reefs will go extinct in that kind of environment because it will be t- simply too hot for them to to be viable, which impacts um, ocean populations of fish and, and other sea creatures that depend on the reefs. And that's just one example of something you can look at the Amazon rainforest. That's they're getting increasing droughts in the Amazon just from the warming that's already occurred. And, and, you know, that coupled with um, other destructive practices such as um, slash and burning of the Amazon for agricultural means um, for agricultural needs means that you're going to have, uh, much of the Amazon be destroyed by uh, a combination of climate change and human uh, direct human intrusion, and which will kill off many species in that region, and also alter the climate of the of of South America because the Amazon contributes a lot to contributes a feedback of rainfall across that the tropical um, area of of South America, and the rains will reduce exacerbating drought conditions even more uh, so i mean that's just a couple of examples uh and not and i mean by 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 20 the 2040s you're not going to have any more sea ice in the summer in the arctic i mean that's going to be that's going to be gone uh, pretty quick uh so and we're pretty much locked into this at this point because even if we stopped emitting carbon, the only way to have uh, an effect on this would be to remove carbon from the atmosphere. But we don't have any there, – there's no serious ideas about how to do that, are there? Uh, no. I mean there are, there are ideas and they, they, they sound scientifically viable in a, in a way, but – the problem is the scale of them needed for the huge, huge amount of carbon that's sitting in the atmosphere. I mean, there's, there's, um, I don't, I don't uh, profess to understand them, but so people can certainly look them up for themselves. But there's uh, certain farming practices that uh, talk of um, um, grounding carbon in the ground in in farming in in as part of farming practice. There's um, obviously. Um, uh, direct air capture. Um, there's um, there's um, other um, of uh, direct air capture of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There's um, the use of of um, plants themselves, where you g- grow a bunch of plants. Um, they s- take in the carbon, burn burn them, and then ground that carbon into the soil or into rock. Um, uh, there, there's all sorts of things that that have been shown to work on very small scales, but but the scales that are required ha- have a lot of issue in terms of electricity use, water use, um, land use, uh, because obviously you're competing with agriculture and cities and people um, for land to do these a lot of these practices. So the 
the issue of the scale has been um, been the biggest challenge. I mean, because we're so we're so far along. I mean, in terms of of global warming. I mean, one. I mean, the the global warming that we've already done is starting to set off, as I you know, as I said, these feedback loops and set up you know, like melting of the permafrost, melting of sea ice. Um, I mean, much of the glaciers uh, um, of the or the the land ice of of Greenland is doomed. I mean, it's gonna uh, and sea level rise is is locked in for for a, a very long time. Um, the there's a there's a lot that you'd have to um, reverse and do so very quickly that make the the po- possible solutions to climate change very difficult to 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 implement to say the least. Right. So human civilization, as we've been used to it over the course of the last century, is really not going to be possible. Uh. I, I would say I would say I agree with that. It, it's um, I think I mean I mean just from the slower uh, sea level rise. I mean you're going to have potentially uh, uh, a couple meters of sea level rise by. I mean I, I know everybody <laughs> complains about these these end of the century timelines, but yes, by the end of the century you could have a couple meters, but by 2050 it could be two feet, three feet of sea level rise. I mean that's I mean that's that's uh, devastating. I mean, sea level rise. I mean it's devastating for coastal cities because their ports become flooded. I mean how are you going to have um, economic uh, this relentless economic growth that everyone talks about, um, which uh, if you can't even have uh, your port cities functional, um, you're going to have um, land become flooded. Um, in places like Florida, um, the the you're going to have salt intrusion to water tables for drinking water and in water for agriculture. Um, you're going to have um, mass movement of people because now you're losing uh, losing land and having increasing flooding in, in coastal countries like Bangladesh. So people have to move to other areas. So it's going to cause civil unrest and and conflicts between nations because you know unfortunately uh, a lot of people aren't going to be very sympathetic to other peoples that aren't like them and they're going to want to keep them out of their countries um so uh i mean it's i mean that that's just with sea level rise that's relatively slower than some of these other issues um we discuss you can discuss like extreme heat and 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 other uh, significant uh climate events that are that are ongoing that can affect people's ability to to live and function and and but it's you you know people don't realize just how um, delicate um, ecosystem and human systems really are until until things have been so altered so rapidly that they no longer function the way they should or the way they have for for forever right and the fact that the the mainstream media has trouble reporting on this issue has definitely been an exacerbating factor in not making it a priority in in people's thinking yeah i mean it's it's really it's really not a priority i mean i mean human Humans and it's reflected in the in the media, but humans in general are very 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 short term thinkers, um, you know. Uh, so to even think, you know, how altered how altered will the world be in ten years, um, let alone twenty, thirty, forty years is it, it's not it's not really part of human the human condition for most people to do that. And but I mean these changes. I mean, just to be able, just to look at a graph of projected sea level rise or a graph of projected uh, temperature rise, and I mean the IPCC, for example, was even their their high high emission scenarios for those kind of things have uh, seemed to be conservative based on what's happening now. 
but those those um, those graphs are quite dramatic for um, a very altered world that is going to be much more difficult to survive in and and thrive in um, as humans and obviously for other life on this planet. Um, but yet it doesn't seem to click with people because we think, you know, day to day, maybe year to year, and we don't think that far in the future. But I mean, you take, if you were to have time travel and take someone that lived in the fifties and sixties and transport them to now, and they were a relatively informed person in the 1950s and sixties to the climate and to life. And you transport them here. It's like, like, uh, it would be like, you know, going onto an alien planet. <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I have a friend that, um, that, that writes fictional stories and she's read obviously books of other fictional stories about life and she lives in Florida. So like life in Florida and they, and they, in the book they describe, you know, the climate just, just as a aside, aside the climate in Florida in the 1930s and, and you think, oh, somebody in the 1930s comes to Florida and now it's like freakishly hot <laughs> and right. humid beyond belief. You know, you know, it's like a dramatic, sh- dramatic shift. You know, you, you, but people don't really experience uh, life that way, or they they have recency bias where they they think, oh, things haven't ch- things haven't really changed that much in in all these years, but they're thinking about how things have been recently and not thinking about how it was 30, 40 years ago, if they're an older person, unless they really, really consider um, how things were back then versus now. And the changes that we're going to be facing are going to be so much faster than they were in the past. And it, it might get to a point where people are start, you know, really start understanding these, how fast these changes are. Uh, but by then it'll be It'll be too late to do anything about them. And really, the, the next 20, 30 years of changes are too late to do anything about. Yeah. So, you know, it seems as though, in general, all of this is, um, it seems in general that all of this is too big to stop or to reverse. And so, all we've got at this point is, uh, yeah. Trying to figure out the most intelligent ways to respond. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I, it's going to change, and we can't do anything about that. So, what are we gonna? How are we gonna adjust ourselves to these changes? I guess I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for for humanity, the 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 best way to respond is even if it's uh, too late to stop the, you know, at least the some of them most dramatic changes that are expected in the coming years and decades, it's never too late to, to do the right thing, whether it's re- reducing, you know, the amount of carbon we put out into the atmosphere to the best of our ability, whether it's, um, re- you know, doing things like rewilding the land or, or, or doing, um, assisted migration of, of plants and animals, to other areas that are that would be hospitable, more hospitable for them to survive. Um, uh, doing things like helping island nations, peoples, and with sea level rise, and and helping you know it, it's you know this uh, idea of mitigation and adaptation. It's really um, um, the mitigation part is really hard, but. You know, the adaptation has to be realistic to the idea that you simply you simply can't stop um, what's happening in in a um, like stopping a car with a brake. It's going to continue, but you can at least do what you can to help help your fellow human being and help uh, fellow species from suffering the consequences at least so fast. Um, of those changes that can't be stopped. Um, but right now it, it doesn't really seem like <laughs> humanity has even, even, um, I forget like solutions to climate change, trying to stop climate change in its tracks. Like there's not even really a thought of, of, um, of, of those, uh, sort of adaptation measures because it would require 
really putting climate change front and center in everything in Paul in, 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 in your daily life and your, in the social life, in political life. And I mean, right, right now we're dealing with, um, you know, increasing authoritarianism and other increasing responses to to um, what seems to be social um, or economic collapse. So um, the idea of being more um, more um, um, compassionate seems to be lost, unfortunately, amongst most people. I mean, you, you see some signs that it could be there, especially with the pandemic. Some, you know, people are are doing things to be more compassionate to others, but, 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 but it's not, there's not a big enough sense of the, of the future quite yet to, to understand, um, what needs to be done on huge scales amongst nations and peoples to try to, um, uh, uh, make, um, the world a more compassionate place as we go through these changes. Yeah, on, on those subjects, I'm I'm really encouraged when I interact with or hear what the younger generations are saying, you know, especially the people in their 30s and 20s and even younger who do seem to be aware of how all these issues are connected. Uh, they don't have the same – a lot of them don't have the same um, – affection for the system as older people do in large part because they haven't been benefiting from it, you know, in the same ways, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, like, like my parents are almost 80, you know, in their generation, you know, just they, they got to have the thing where it's like, Oh, you have the same job for 40 years and you get a nice retirement. And I mean, all that kind of thing that just doesn't happen, you yeah. know, <laughs> anymore. And so the, so the, I, I feel like the young people, um, uh, if we have any hope at all, it's, it's, it's with them. And, you know, uh, I, I would, I would, you know, personally like to see a cultural shift where, you know, people either get out of their way or, or help them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, was, uh, it would have been, it'd be nice to have leaders that are, that are younger, um, um, and, and have an, you know, more of an opportunity to, to, to have their ideas, um, presented and taken seriously. Um, but I mean, you, you can see just from the presidential election, <laughs> everybody's old. And, I know. And Warren and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I mean, it's like, you know, between, you know, the choice between relatively conservative values or, or fascist authoritarianism. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right among yeah. among yeah among yeah i mean it's uh a friend of mine used the word gerontocracy to describe yeah yeah, yeah. the united states right now you know yeah. yeah yeah so uh people you you uh you you um post stuff about this all these stories online all the time and you have a patreon page where you keep people updated i'm hoping you can tell uh people where to find your stuff i i really personally find it um uh very helpful to follow you and see the stories that you're putting up in your commentary and i have i don't find it i don't find information that that's that is that useful in many other places so you could tell us um where other people could find that yeah i do a lot of my day-to-day -day stuff like news sharing and and some and sometimes commentary and stuff on my facebook page for you know weather and climate and news it's on um it's me i'm under uh, meteorologist nick humphrey on facebook so you just type it in the search engine and you should be able to find me there um i do occasional uh longer write-ups and climate reports and stuff like that on my patreon and um i'm always uh always grateful for people that are um can support me on patreon and um that's a uh, www.patreon.com slash meteorologist Nick Humphrey. So that's where I am on Patreon. So, um, yeah, I do, I do a lot of stuff there. I'm unemployed currently looking for work, um, under, um, I've never actually had, had a job as a meteorologist. It's kind of funny. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's been hard <laughs> to find, find work the past few years. Cause it's, 
you know, you're competing against people that are that either had the uh, benefit of getting ex- getting like free experience under people sort of like apprenticeships and whatever, or you get uh, people that are older that that take the jobs and keep up the jobs and and so everything requires all this education and experience and I have like a master's degree and it still wasn't enough. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's been, it's, it's, and it's like that in most fields in recent years where it's just hard to get it, get, get your foot in the door. So I'm, I've moved on to other things, um, uh, as far as, um, work is concerned, but, uh, but I still, you know, try to utilize my knowledge and background and, and uh, the knowledge of other people as well to to inform uh, people about what's going on as far as climate change is concerned and ecological ecological destruction. It's um, it's the most important information and in, in news of our time, and it um, sometimes, like you said, does get buried behind other other things. But it's 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 important to talk about no matter what what and when. Who are the people who you like to follow for climate news? Um, um, I like um, uh, on Twitter. There's this guy named Zach Labe, um, L A B E. He does. He's a, I believe he's a PhD now. He does a lot of updates and on the Arctic, um, uh, the situation in the Arctic. Um, uh, I I I share. A, he has a he has a website um, um, for folks. If you want to find him on Twitter, you can, and then find his website through there. But um, yeah, he I share a, a lot of his um, per, like um, maps and and graphs because they do. He does a lot of graphs showing the sea ice extend and and decline in the sea ice over time on a monthly basis, and it's really helpful. Um, and um. I, I follow, yeah, I, I mean, I follow other various people on, on Twitter. And by the way, I guess I'm, I'm on Twitter, so people can learn who I follow by who I share. Oh, okay, cool. Um, well, I'll, I'll put all those links in the, in the show notes for this. So, okay. Yeah. Hmm. I'm abrupt climo met on Twitter. Um, so I, I don't really talk a lot on Twitter, but I do share a lot of other people, uh, on Twitter and, get a lot of because there's just a lot of valuable people on twitter that aren't on facebook so uh-huh. uh yeah so i get a lot of good stuff um from from others um yeah because yeah it's it i mean it's just stuff doesn't stop just because of a pandemic it's just because of um the social and civil situation the climate change continues so i try to get get the information out there any way i can Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.